Johnny Dollar. Well, now, how are you, Johnny? This is Ripley Teeter, Worldwide Mutual Insurance. Well, hi, Rip. How's dear old Memphis, Tennessee? <laughs> Finest town on God's green earth, Johnny. Always was, always will be. Well, now, when did you join the Chamber of Commerce? It what, sir? Say, so isn't it just about time for your big annual celebration? Oh, you're too late, Johnny. Cotton Carnival's all over and done with for this year. Now, you should have called me sooner. Well, now, why, Johnny? These fine people here in Memphis never give us any trouble. Well, what are you calling about? Oh, uh, well, uh, uh, trouble, Johnny. Real big trouble. I thought you just finished telling me. Yeah, I did, I did, Johnny. This little problem I'm calling about happens to be over in the nearby town of Somerville. Well, now, make up your mind, Rip. What's it? Well, which is it, a little problem or big trouble? Well, now, I suppose that kind of depends on just how you look at it, Johnny. Look at what? Murder. Murder? Yes, sir. Murder. CBS Radio brings you Bob Reddick in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company Memphis office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the stock in trade matter. It was bright and early in the day. I was able to make an immediate plane reservation, so expense account item one is 7275, airfare to Memphis, Tennessee. And by shortly afternoon, we started circling for a landing over the big industrial city there on the eastern bank of Ole Miss. Soon as I cleared my baggage at the airport, I spent item two, six and a quarter, for a taxi into Ripley Teeter's office on Union Street near 3rd. Taxi, Johnny? Now, why didn't you all just rent yourself a car at the airport? Well, sit down. Thanks. I'll have my secretary get one for you. Maribel, honey, I have one of those nice rental cars brought around front for Mr. Dollar, huh? What time? Right away. Thank you, honey. You uh, mentioned something about a town called Somerville. Yeah, about 40, 45 miles sort of east of him. What happened over there? Uh, like I told you on the telephone, Johnny, murder. And the deceased is a client of ours named of Volney Beauregard Exum. That's a mouthful. Uh, that's three mighty fine old family names, Johnny. That figures. Yes, sir. Anyhow, uh, early this morning, uh, his housekeeper found him laying over his desk with his head bashed in. Have the police over there any theories, anything to go on? No, sir, not a thing. No fingerprints on that heavy hand iron that was used on him. No clues of any kind, nothing. So that's why I think maybe you ought to go over there and take a look around. How big a town is Somerville? Oh, less than a couple of thousand, I guess. I see. Now, that used to be the heart of some real important plantation country. That's where the extra money came from, Johnny, from cotton. But by the time it got down to Volney Beauregard, well, he was still living in the old plantation house, but most of the property around had all been sold off. In other words, old Exum wasn't worth very much money. And I'm afraid that's true, Johnny. But he somehow managed to keep up the payments on his insurance. How much? Well, face value, 35000 Mm-hmm. I don't rightly know just where he got his living income from. Of course, after the war, when some of these fine old southern families had to sell off the land, they made some investments and things. You mean the Civil War rip? I said the war, didn't I? <laughs> Go on. Well, anyhow, I don't really know where he got his living money, except maybe from his kinfolk. Well, that brings up the question of beneficiary. Those very same kinfolk, Johnny, only ones he got left. Who are they? Well, no wife or young uns of his own, so let's see here on his policy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a niece and a couple of nephews, Johnny. 
Now, let's see. Uh, there's Clarabelle Otway Exum. You have her address there? Uh, let's see. Oh, just let uh, me use this uh, scratch pad. I'll copy the policy. Yeah, go right ahead. And like you see, she lives right here in town. Works in a five and dime, I understand. And there's a nephew, also a name of Volney Beauregard Exum. Lives down in Corpus Christi, Texas, yes, see? All right, I got it. Then there's other nephew named a Culpepper Van Buren Oglethorpe right there in Somerville. Works at a real estate office. Although it beats me how he makes a living at it. Yeah, that's all, Johnny. Just those three. Okay. In other words, they're the only ones who will benefit by Exum's death, huh? Well, now, that's right, Johnny, but... Surely you don't think one of them could have killed him. Why not? Fine old Southern family like that. Did he have any enemies that you know about? Fine old man like Volney Beauregard Exum. Did he have many friends? Well, uh, no. No, I guess he didn't, really. Kind of just kept to himself, living out his days there on the plantation house. All alone with just his pride, just living out his days. Now, you mentioned a housekeeper. Yeah, well, Miss Dollar Cato just did some day work for him. And don't you go suspecting her, Johnny, why she couldn't hurt a fly. Well, you are a lot of help. Well, maybe I better not suspect anybody, huh? That's right. Uh, well, no, uh, well, what I mean to say now, is... Now, 35,000, uh, three beneficiaries. Uh, yes, sir. Equal? Yes, sir. So maybe 11, 12,000 apiece. That's not very much. Well, now, I understand they'll share the rest of the estate, too. Oh, what do you think that plantation's worth? That old rundown house and the little bitty piece of land where it sits, maybe ten thousands all. No idea what kind of money old Exum had to live on, where it came from? No, bank accounts or nothing, Johnny. He even paid cash premiums on his insurance. I guess he didn't like banks and such. Well, you sure don't give me much to go on. Uh, one more question. Did the uh, killer ransack the house? Well, no, not that I know of. So maybe you better take a look, huh? Yeah, Rip, I think I'd better. Proud we are, we being the CBS Radio Network, to be able to bring you on this station each weekday the songs of Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney. In addition to the sparkling Bing Crosby-Rosemary Clooney show, we're equally delighted to present at the same time each weekday the assorted talents of Art Linkletter, the house party man, Gary Moore and Derwood Kirby, and the rousing Arthur Godfrey time. There's no business like show business, and nowhere else such a fine sampling of same than on this blockbuster CBS Radio Network Entertainment Fest. The nicest thing about it is, should you miss any or all of these great stars on a Monday, you can catch right up with them the next day, or any weekday you're so minded. Remember, nowhere else can you enjoy each and every weekday the Bing Crosby, Rosemary Clooney show, the conversational gifts of Gary Moore and his perfect foil, Derwood Kirby, the kids' comedy and cut-ups of Art Linkletter's house party, and the air of glee with gusto that's a specialty of Arthur Godfrey time. Before driving to Somerville to look over the scene of the crime... I checked up on Mr. Exum's niece, Clarabelle. I found her in the stock room of the 5 and 10 where she worked. She was a thin, wan-looking girl of about 30 with long, black, stringy hair badly set in a knot that bobbed about the back of her neck as she talked in a high, nasal voice that fairly set my teeth on edge. Excuse me while I set this box of ribbon. Sure. And if you all want the truth, Mr. Dollar, I am just as glad as I can be that old Uncle Valney died. He was murdered, Miss Exum. Well, he's gone, anyhow. And when I get my share from his insurance and that property, I can pay all my bills and buy myself some fancy new clothes and lots of things. Well, then you're not at all sorry about this? Of course not. He had nothing to live for anyhow, Mr. Dollar. All alone out there in that house by herself, nobody to talk to except poor Miss Cato two, three times a week when she come to claim. The poor Mrs. Cato? How poor, Clarabelle? Uh -huh. Well, actually, she probably has more money than Uncle Valney ever had. Count up some of her kinfolks dying and leaving all that big property over to Whiteville. See, she was a Beaufort, 
on her widowed sister's husband's side. Yeah, well... And when her cousin Sally May, she had some Buford blood and kin, too. I see. And when she died, with all the money and things from her cousin once removed... Oh, and now, wait a minute. He was her father's nephew's half-brother, is what it was. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'll take your word for it. Now, this Mrs. Cato, if she had money, why did she work as a housekeeper? Oh, just out of pity for Uncle Von and him being all alone and all. Didn't you ever go out to see him? He never did want to see me, did he? I wouldn't know. No! All he cared about was sitting there counting his money and keeping his relatives from getting any of it. Except maybe call Papa. And now we'll get it anyhow, Mr. Dollar. Uh, where did his money come from, Clarabelle? Don't you know, Mr. Dollar? No. Well, now that's funny. All right, so it's funny. Now, where did the money come from? Oh, I don't know. I thought you did. Now, excuse me, I gotta get these boxes put away. Lest the boss comes back here and sees me just sitting and talking. Boss don't hold much with sitting and talking. <laughs> More questions, more useless answers. Little old Clarabelle simply didn't know anything that might be helpful to me, and didn't care. Except, that is, for whatever money might be coming to her. Maybe the Exum family was smart and prosperous once. But if she was any criterion, they'd done mighty poorly in the last couple of generations. I knew this. If she'd had anything to do with her uncle's death, she'd probably have left signs all over the place. So I drove on over to Somerville to the Exum home, or rather what was left of it. A hundred years ago, it might have been a mansion, but now it was just a wreck. Two of the eight big columns on the front had fallen and simply left there to rot away in the sun and rain. Windows were broken and stuffed with newspapers to keep out the draft. There hadn't been a paint job in 20 years, at least. What little was left was cracked and peeling. The yard was nothing but weeds and moss and a thick matting of leaves that never had been raked from under the big trees that were hung heavily with Spanish moss. At the door, I was met by a Sergeant Aiken of the local police. Real glad to see you, Mr. Johnny. That Mr. Teeter from the insurance company phoned you'll be here. Come on in, sir. Oh, on thank in. you, Sergeant. I'd like to see just where and how Mr. Exon was murdered. Yes, sir. Right, right in here in the library. Only I guess the old man must have sold off all his books a long time ago. Now, here, sir. You see, here he was kind of sprawled across the desk there. What's left of it. With that tin box by him pried open. Now, where is the body now? Uh, it's in town for the autopsy, him being all alone when he was murdered. His housekeeper wasn't here? She's the one come in early this morning to do her work and found him laying here dead. I see. Go on. Well, it's it's all pretty obvious, Miss Johnny. Somebody just come in here, found him sitting here with this little tin box in front of him. And... What was in it? May I touch it? Oh, yeah. Might as well. We couldn't find a single fingerprint on it. Not even Mr. X. No prints at all? No, sir. No prints at all. Uh, Chief, he knows about them things. He went around with a kit for prints, dust and everything. Yeah, whoever did this must have worn gloves and also wiped off everything he touched, just, just to be absolutely sure. Yeah, must have been real careful. I see. Yeah, even, even this heavy hand iron he used to kill him with. Chief even uh, checked the doorknobs, everything else for prints. Any idea then how the killer might have got in? Well, Chief and I have been through the place with a fine tooth comb, Mr. Johnny. You ask me, the old man must have... Let him in. When? Doc says he's killed sometime late last night. Late? Yes, sir, that's right. Well, then from what I've heard about Mr. Exon, it had to be somebody that he knew pretty well. Yes, sir. But trying to find anybody he knew that well, this old recluse, anybody he'd let in at night, well, yeah, the chief had a couple of the boys working on to her, but I don't see how they're going to come up with anybody. Any idea what might have been in this old tin box? Well, probably whatever money the old man had on hand. Where'd he get his money, Sergeant? Now, that's a good question, Mr. Johnny. I know that he never had any bank accounts, but he would uh, cash a check now and then. Well, if he had no account, I and can't... He never sold any real estate for the last 25 years. Didn't have any to sell except, except this old place here. Well, this box certainly couldn't hold enough to keep him going for... Oh, wait a minute. What's 
What's this? Uh, looks like a couple of pieces of paper stuck there in the hinge. There's a corner of something torn off. Let's see if I can get it out without more tearing. Them corners weren't tore off of any money. That's for sure. No. No, this looks like a sort of parchment paper that's used for an insurance policy. Or maybe... Maybe that's where his money came from. What are you thinking of, Mr. Johnny? Two possibilities, Sergeant. One, the obvious one, that he had a lot of money hidden away in some secret place around this house. Well, now, we, we thought of that. On the other hand, if these torn-off corners, freshly torn, too, I believe, if they mean what I... Now, listen, there's a nephew living right here in Somerville, isn't there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, there is. Big enough to have wielded this heavy and iron so effectively... What, sir? Well, certainly Clarabelle couldn't have done it. <laughs> Mr. Johnny, you, you're talking about his own kinfolk. Besides, she's too stupid to have covered her tracks. Well, now, if, if, you're, if you're talking about stupid... Yeah. Well, that, that nephew on his mother's side, mm -hmm. that Culpepper Oglethorpe living here in town, yeah. I mean, the one's supposed to be working at real estate, but he ain't, kind of, he ain't doing anything. All he ever got was from his, uh, from his uncle. Go on, Sergeant. Well, he's so stupid that maybe he would kill one of his own kin. Where is he? Of course, I suppose so. Most anybody kills for money, though. Where will I find him? And you know, none of them, none of them three had any use for old Exum. And only, only one of the boys could have used this, this heavy hand on. Sergeant. And with Culpepper, the only one of the boys near enough to do it, you know. All right, where is he? Oh. What? Well, all, all I said was, oh. Come on, Sergeant. No, no, sir, Mr. Johnny. Culpepper didn't do it. Well, how do you know? How can you be sure? Well, it seems he had some trouble a couple of weeks ago. Pulled a pulled a knife on a man. Well, then he is the type. He may be the type, Mr. Johnny, but, well, ever since he's been locked up in jail. Still is. Oh. Yes, sir. Frustrating case, this one. There was nothing I could really put my finger on. The Somerville police were doing just as much as I was and were accomplishing just as much. Nothing. What about the other nephew, who also bore the name of Valny Beauregard Exxon? Rip had mentioned that he lived in Corpus Christi, down in Texas. Yes, sir, Mr. Johnny. Five, uh, six years, I'd say. Uh, what does he do down there, Sergeant? Well, I, I don't know that, sir. All I know is he had a fight with his uncle once. Mr. Exum gave him money to get out of town, so he did. He, he hasn't been back. I wonder. Uh, when I phoned him uh, there in Corpus this morning and told him what happened, mm -hmm. he said he was sorry that he couldn't get down here. He was pretty tied up, but he, he'd be glad to pay for a decent funeral. I'm sure he would. As of these torn-off corners of paper are what I think they are. Yeah, it looks to me like young Volney Exum's the only one that's any good of them three. Yes, sir. I mean, if he can afford a nice funeral for somebody... You bet he can. Now, listen, Sergeant, maybe I'm all wrong in playing a hunch that one of his relatives killed the old man, but it's all I've got to go on. I'll say this, Mr. Johnny. A hunch is no kind of proof. I know, I know, and proof is what I need. But even without it, I'm going down to Corpus Christi. And then, now believe me, I'll be the first to admit it. To admit that luck, sheer luck, is what helped me to solve this one. It came by way of a pile of letters just inside the mail slot by the front door. On top was an envelope with a familiar company name across the upper left-hand corner. Intrastate Telephone Company. Before the sergeant could stop me, I tore it open. And sure enough, a dividend check for $250. With intrastate telephone paying 50 cents a share, and I know because I own some of that stock myself, here was a dividend on some 500 shares, over $40,000 worth. All right, expense account item three after a mad drive back to Memphis, 5150, plane fare to Corpus Christi. It was late by then. So item four is $22 even, and that includes a cab into the Robert Driscoll Hotel, cocktails and dinner, and my room bill for the night. First thing in the morning, 
at a brokerage office on Lawrence Street, I was talking to my old friend Wayne Stockson. Well, to answer them in order, Johnny, I'm fine, thank you. And I do think ours is the biggest stockbroker's office here in town. And yes, we do have a client by the unlikely name of Volney Beauregard Exum. But it's a very small account, though. Is he a young fellow, Wayne? Oh, I'd say uh, somewhere in his 30s. He's been my customer about five years now. Does he own much in stocks? Well, now, John... Now, Wayne, I have got to know. Does he buy or sell in lots of 100, 500 shares at a time, maybe? Eggs? <laughs> Now, look, Johnny, I mean, you know how it is. Yeah, I, mean, I know business. how it is. A client's business is confidential. Why don't you ask him? What? He called a little while ago. Seems that he has some old securities that he wants to cash in. And he... Oh, wait a minute, there it comes now. Intrastate telephone. Well, that's right. How the world did you have an... Uh, right over here, Mr. Edson. All right, now, I'll sit over here at this other desk. Now, pay no attention to me. Look, Johnny, I don't understand... Morning, Mr. Exum. Morning, Mr. Stark, sir. Sit down, won't you? Thank you, sir. Now then, uh, are these the uh, two certificates that you want to cash in? Yes, sir. Mm hmm. All right. We just uh, sign these over to us. Sign right here, if you will. I believe there's a little ink in that pen. Uh, right here, sir. Yeah, that's right. That's uh, quite a bit to sell all at once. I know, I know. I must say, I didn't realize that you had this sort of business. I want uh, cash for these, Mr. Stark, sir. All in cash? i got to make a business trip. Maybe gone sometime. Well, I don't know, Mr. Exum. Uh, let's see, this would come to over 40000 Now, uh, look here, sir. I'm an old customer. Yes, I know that's true. So, uh, here you are. Just uh, get me the cash and I'll be on my way. Don't bother, Wayne. What, Johnny? I said don't bother. Just call a policeman. Well, who are you, sir? Call a cop, Wayne. These signatures are forgeries. What are you talking about? You trying to say that I ain't... that I'm not Volney Beauregard Exum? You, you tell him, Stocksy. This is Volney Beauregard Exum, Johnny. Sure it is, Wayne, but these signatures are forgeries. You're crazy. They were stolen from his uncle up in Memphis, also named Volney Beauregard Exum, and they were stolen from him when this man murdered him. Murdered him? You... You think you can prove that? I can prove it, Exxon. Now, listen With him. two little pieces of paper that you left behind in a tin box where your uncle kept these stock certificates. No, I didn't leave anything. Look, do you see how these corners tore off fit perfectly on these certificates? I, I thought I took everything. I, I, you I mean... mean after you killed him? Yes, I know. Let me out of here. Stop him, Johnny. Uh, Stick around, Exxon. <laughs> You want to call the police now, Wayne? Yeah. Sure. What Exxon didn't know, of course, was that Wayne would have done a lot of investigating before handing over all that money. In spite of the way that he'd carried a small account with the firm to set things up for the murder and robbery. Expense account total, including the trip back to Memphis and then back to Hartford, we'll call it 325 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Uh, next week, one of the cleverest rackets in jewelry that I ever saw. Over a million dollars worth. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Reddick, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Here in our cast were Wendell Holmes as the police sergeant, Joan Loring as Clara Bell, Robert Dryden as Ripley Teeter, Mandel Kramer as Wayne Stockseth, and Ralph Dell as Volney Beauregard Exxon. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hanna speaking.